So listen to me. Listen to what I say. Listen to the way I say it and the way that it has been said over and over again, the way that it has been told. Time after time. Time before time. Time beyond time. Once upon a time, Coyote was wandering in his usual way, aimlessly. Looking for something to happen. And as he wandered, a sound came to his ears. And it seemed to him that it was the sound of a great crowd of people celebrating. And he thought to himself, oh, they're probably dancing. They must have really good food there. I think I will find these people and join the celebration. I've been alone too long. So he, he tried to locate where the sound was coming from and he went this way and it seemed that the sound was coming from somewhere else and he went the other way and then it seemed that it was coming from a different direction and no matter which way he went, he couldn't find the village. He couldn't find the crowd of people. He couldn't find the delicious food that he was imagining. Finally, he stopped and stood still. And he could still hear that sound of that crowd celebrating. And he looked down at his feet and he saw the bleached white skull of an elk. And he noticed that there was a mass of flies swooping in through one eye hole and out the neck. And as they swooped through the skull, the skull acted as a echo chamber and a great roar as if a crowd were celebrating came to his ears and he said oh my goodness it's not a village of people it's a village of flies but I did say I would join them <laughs> so he picked up the skull and try as he might he could not get his head into that neck hole. It was too small. <laughs> he was getting frustrated. And he said out loud, as if to no one, how in the world am I going to get my head into this skull? And the flies answered him. They said, easy. You just say the magic words. Neck, grow larger. So, Coyote said the magic words, Neck, grow larger. And the neck hole grew larger. And he slipped a skull over his head. And as soon as he did that, the flies disappeared. Well, Coyote was feeling proud of himself. Until he tried to pull the skull back off. <laughs> well, he tried everything. He tried to break it off with rocks. He tried to pull it off until his neck was chafed and sore. And he finally realized that there was nothing he could do he was going to have to find some people to help him.
And so, fortunately, he could see out through the eye holes. And he began to walk. And he knew that in a certain direction there was a river. And he knew that if he followed the river long enough, he would come to a village. And so he went to the river. And when, when he got to the water's edge, he came to a, a pool at the side of the river. And he saw his reflection. And he saw the majestic antlers rising from his head. And he recognized something. Something magnificent. Something rather grand in the way he looked. So he continued. Soon enough, he came to the place where the people had made a village by the river. And there were washing stones set up. But it was evening, and all the people were in their, in their places. And he decided that he would lay down there by the river and wait till dawn. Because Coyote had an idea. So he wrapped himself in his raccoon skin blanket and he laid down there with the elk skull on his head. And in the morning, at the first light, a woman came down from the village and she was approaching the water to take a drink when she saw a horrible monster furry, with a bone face and antlers reaching up to the sky. And she turned and she began to run away. She shrieked. And Coyote spoke in a regal voice. Do not run away from me. I am the divine water spirit and I have come to bless your village. Go and tell the people to prepare all the offerings. <laughs> and prepare them in the proper manner. And bring the offerings here to me and receive my blessing. And oh, by the way, tell a strong man to bring an ax. And so the woman did, just as she was told. And she went back and she told the people that the magnificent water spirit had come to bless their village and that they were to prepare the offerings in the appropriate manner, and they did so. And eventually, all was ready, and they went to the water's edge, and they laid out all the offerings and Coyote surveyed them. And he saw that all was in order. And he said, now bring forth the ax and strike me on the head. And so the strong man stepped forward with the ax and he struck Coyote a blow in the middle of his forehead. And the skull was split and one half fell to the left, and one half fell to the right. And in that moment, the people looked, and they saw, and they said, oh, fuck. <laughs> it's just coyote. <laughs> And they were about to all walk away. And Coyote said, wait, 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 wait. Listen, I have something to say. 
because you have given all of this in earnest and you have laid it out in the proper manner, it won't be for nothing. Take the halves of this skull, skull and use it to make medicine. Use these as bowls and you will find that the medicine that comes out of this mask will be most efficacious. And then Coyote turned and disappeared. Well, the people weren't too sure. But they decided to give it a try. And they took that skull and they used it just the way Coyote had told them to do. And you know they found that the medicine that came from those two bowls had a great potency. And so they, they lived and they prospered in that way. And that's all I know. Can somebody put my uh, notebook back here for me? Thank you, Robert. Okay, that'll do it. You want to read it upside down? Or? No, I guess I won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm going to read. Um, it's difficult to jump into the middle of this book because uh, so much depends on what came before. But I, I hope that I've given you enough that 30% that, uh, of it will make sense. This is uh, from a section of the book that surrounds the story I just told. And of course, you know, it, when, when the book comes out and you read the story, um, it will be different. Because it's never quite the same. So this is from a section of the book called Masquerade. The terribly difficult task of coming to accept, integrate, and utilize the story of the mask-like imposed identity formed in the mirror of malicious eyes, and still somehow managed to affirm, cultivate, and maintain the implicate identity is something akin to the task of a traditional performer wearing a mask. In both cases, the mask occupies and displays an axial or transitional space between the actor and a deity or spirit. Thus, the affective power, the affective power of the imposed identity is that it functions exactly as the sacred mask. It invokes in the mind of the beholder, as well as the wearer, the, arch the archegestic leap. I'm not going to try to explain that, but it has to do with the leaping consciousness, the ability to make these, these, um, far-flung associations. Within every rigid social structure, the implicate identity is invisible. Only the imposed identity is recognized. It is as if, unbeknownst to us, the trickster Hermes has crowned us with the magical helmet of invisibility. 
yet instead of realizing the, the gift, that is invisibility in the soul, which allows us to sneak around the back and drop the present through the window, one is stricken with feelings of isolation, grief, and betrayal. This circumstance is, to say the least, uncomfortable. Perhaps for some, unendurable. Nevertheless, if the asynchronies and betrayals of life are to be truly faced and lived, infantile protestation against one's rotten lot in life will accomplish very little. Graceful acceptance will help. Realization with cunning will be even better. <laughs> Deferral is disappointed destiny. Assigning blame, merely abdication. However repugnant it may be, if one hopes to survive as the other within, it will be vital to accept and exercise the poetic power in the deep ambivalence of the mask. And the act of grasping the efficacy of the imposed or false identity must be approached and executed with reverence. I remember I got very sick while I was writing this because it was so hard for me to come to terms with it. Um, and th this is, the next thing is a quote from a book about um, Balinese mask dancers. It's a wonderful book, which I can't recall the title of, but anyway, um, he says, the mask is approached through a process involving an exploration of its potential life. First by regarding it, and then grounding its life, its movement, its voice, its spirit in the specific body of a specific actor. In the process, the actor addresses the mask and eventually puts it on. This would be like, like Danny's Danny talking to a piteous cripple as if it were a mask. Do you see? And dissociating myself from that and saying, oh, this is a mask, I can use this. All right, so now I'm going to talk to this, this mask and, and get to know it and find out how it affects people and what the dance of this mask is. You see? Okay. The bond between the mask and the actor is finally checked in a mirror. Adjustments made, and the masked persona is then deployed to tell stories from his or her very specific point of view. At each stage of the exercise, the problem is to find a meeting ground between the range of memories and possibilities experienced as the actor's self, the locus of the I, and that which begins outside the self as his and hers, as it and you, as another person's story, another face, another way of talking and being. Now this is me again. The problem of finding the meeting ground is the problem of holding the interval. I'm talking about the leap again, the interval of the leap and being able to hold that tension, all right? <clears throat> While maintaining the locus of I and this without getting torn and reduced to a half self or losing one's sense of self entirely. The implicate is other. That is, it cannot be found in the explicate, known and apparent world. It is deeply interior, rooted in the world interiority. 
I'm suggesting here that uh, uh, it, this is actually something I kind of loathe in psychology where they, they talk about interior and the contents of the psyche as if, you know, it's all in what the human, it's all in the mind. It's all in human consciousness. But there is, the world itself has interiority. All right? If one's otherness is to move beyond the interpersonal realm, it must be moved outside the self, embodied, enacted, performed, danced, sung, and actualized within the exterior interpersonal realm. To put it bluntly, in order to communicate the personal, universal, unknown, one has to forego membership and become unknown. To put it bluntly, in order to communicate the personal universal unknown, one has to forgo membership and become unknown, namely the other within. When the trickster said to the woman, you will be able to use what you find inside the mask to make medicine, did he indicate the inner lining of the elk skull or himself? Or was he referring to the leaping mind of trickster, the fertile emptiness between the inner and outer shape? The invisible power of the mask is the interval of the leap. It is neither the deity nor the performer. It is neither this nor that. It is spirit and flesh. It is a crossroads thing, the third thing, which is no thing. Impossibly, it participates across all categories, transgressing all boundaries, expressing chaos within cosmos and the forest within the village. The mask is initiatory and confirmatory at the same time. Initiation occurs intrapersonally in isolation in the forest, whereas confirmation occurs interpersonally in community in the village. I have to interject something. One of the things that uh, I try to make a distinction is between the idea of approval, which is what we have in Western society, uh, and confirmation, which is what we do not have. All right, so approval is a substitute for confirmation. And approval then becomes, because we're never satisfied, we can never get enough approval, uh, it becomes an addictive substance. All right, whereas confirmation, confirmation comes, you know, from the elders or from the ancestors when, uh, uh, an initiatory transformation has occurred. And when you receive that confirmation, you're done. You don't need the confirmation again. You'll need another confirmation for the next thing that you do, for the next transformation. But you won't need to run around trying to earn approval. All right. Yeah, yeah. Confirmation is sort of being seen in an authentic way. Being seen in, a, in an authentic way is confirmation. All right. I'm almost done here. If one recalls that the life sequence of initiatory passages delineates the various stations of social structural status with an abysmal death between each station, I like that a lot. <laughs> Can I read that again? If one recalls that the life sequence of initiatory passages delineates the various stations of socio-structural status with an abysmal death between each station, then all initiatory crises must be accepted as inevitable and unavoidable 
with liminality as fundamental to life. Do we all know what liminality is? Liminality is, uh, limin means the threshold. So to be liminal means to be neither here nor there. And so I'm saying that liminality, like the implicate order that Bohm talks about, is really fundamental to our existence. Is that really a paradox? Of course it's a paradox. Yes. And with this acceptance comes the further realization that what is desperately missing in the modern world is the soulful confirmation of the newly initiated condition, the confirmatory capacities of living myth, and this especially for the other within, as it is our very otherness which most longs for confirmation. All right, I'm going to close it up here. <laughs> to grasp the significance of the mask, it must be recalled that the mask itself is a story. It is crucial to objectify the imposed identity as the masked persona, which is then deployed to tell stories. And most importantly, stories told subjectively, personally, from a very specific vantage point from the deeper standpoint of identity prior to identification. As in the story of Trickster, the implicate identity, which is neither water spirit nor coyote, is revealed in the thunderbolt axe shattering the intervallic mask, the axial leap between inner and outer identity. You know, uh, uh, the moment when that happens, you can feel it, you know. At least for myself, I can say there, there, there's that moment when someone is seeing me as a, a piteous cripple, and then they're seeing me as, oh, marvelous spokesperson singer. And then somehow the two hemispheres of their brain split, and, and something else comes in, and, and they see me. And that's that thunderbolt moment. Is that clear? All right. The imposed identity mask radiates the sacred profane otherness of liminality, which is, which to the structure bound represents a manifestation of lethal chaos. The performance of liminality by the other within provides a disclosure of the hidden yet implicate mythic reality, which is, as it has always been, the wisdom and medicine necessary for the renewal and revitalization of our individual and cultural lives. Thank you. <laughs>